Hi, I'm Jenny Spinner, Chief Editor of Snack Food and Wholesale Bakery. Welcome to our video. I am here with Nancy Jo Seaton, who is president and owner of Seaton Food Consultants. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hello. Jenny. Good morning. Um, so years ago, I went to the Food Safety Summit and there was a speaker, uh, their name has left my brain, but um, the quote that they, they started off with, good, good food doesn't just happen. Uh, it requires the contributions. It requires the contributions of people, um, experts of all sorts. And if you're going to launch a successful quality product or make an existing one better, you might just benefit from the knowledge and experience of somebody like Nancy Joe. And I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about what is inside that big brain of hers. Nancy Joe, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we do. I mean, it's always fun to, to connect with you, but um, it's also, I learn a lot. Uh, I was wondering if you could start off by telling me a little bit about yourself, um, your lifelong interest in food, uh, your career, and how you got to this point, heading up your own consultancy. So I think um, sometimes food is in our blood. So my grandmother is from Italy. She was born in San Martino, and most people don't know what San Martino is famous for. Uh, it's where Columbus came back with pasta from the Far East. And that's where pasta started in Italy. And my grandmother is from a long line of pasta makers. And in fact, when they came to America, when you're steerage, you know, class, third class passenger, you can only bring what you can carry. And the thing my grandmother's mother carried was her pasta machine. And so it's, you know, one of those hand crank Atlas machines oh, yeah. that was made in 1900. And so when they came to the United States in the twenties, that's what she brought with her. And I still have it. And so that kind of love for food and one's need kind of to get your hands in it. Someone asked me yesterday, well, if you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? And in fact, my answer is I would be in the food business because it's like breathing. You've got to have it. I have to be involved every day, whether I'm having a meal that someone has made for me or I've made a meal for someone else. That whole thought about, you know, I'm the type of person who wakes up in the morning and thinks, hmm, what am I going to make for dinner? Kind of just always thinking about how to uh, bring food into my life the same way because that nostalgia is lovely or in a new way because that becomes kind of exciting so I started really being raised by someone who's got you know kind of that food gene I definitely have that and when I wanted to order my life around being in the food business my mother counseled me and said you don't want to be a chef because you're going to have no nights and no weekends and no holidays and I thought oh you're right I'm not because I have a friend who was um, at the time at the CIA and I wanted to follow her, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Culinary Institute of America. And so I went into business, import, export, and found my way into food sales through equipment. And so I had a fantastic mentor who taught me all about how to lay out a restaurant and the equipment and how many BTUs you need if you're making pizza and how many BTUs you need if you've got a diner and things like that. And so that education became really a passion because I fell in love with the operator and someone who really wanted to serve food, right? And then I started to work for the food group in New York City, which was the premier food service advertising agency, and then was picked up by ConAgra, and I managed the Subway account for them. And so was then exposed to the industrial production of food. And what's important about that, you have to remember, is every serving a bullet. And so if you are not right every day with hygiene and with your thoughts about food safety and how you can make that product consistently as a manufacturer serving the industry, you could destroy someone's brand. You could, God forbid, make someone ill or kill them. And so you've got to be on top of your game every day. Never mind about the recipe, but you're sacrificing animals 
and you're making them into a product for human consumption, mm -hmm. you've got to be right all the time, right? Isn't that what they say also about um, protecting our country from terrorists? We have to be right 100% yeah, of the time. Sure. They only have to get lucky once. And so really that's food production as well. You, you never want to get lucky. You got to be right every single time. And so within that, thinking about an industrial approach, right? Scaling up products, you want to make sure that you've got your ingredients right, your processes correct all the time, and you follow them each time. And what the trick about that is that you need to get everyone on board and plugged into how you do it correctly each time. And so making sure that you've got a spirit within the plant, within the manufacturing world that you're running to make sure that everyone is bought in. And so one of my favorite things to do when I was working for ConAgra was to bring my customers to the manufacturing floor because that really gave the folks who are making that Subway turkey or pepperoni mm -hmm a lift because they got to meet the person they were making it for, right? And that was the representative of all the consumers who would consume it. And so that was really a, a thrill for the folks at the manufacturing plant. And when I was with Chiquita years later and I brought Subway franchisees into the plant, they got to meet them. And, and it was just such a great um, gift of spirit and then the franchisee brought them coupons for free sandwiches at her restaurant that was down the street from the plant. And they would bring her, you know, the products that they made and she would, That's she cool. would bring them lunch. And it was just wonderful to really make that connection. And I think when you take the time to make that connection, that emotional bond is there because everybody bonds over food, mm -hmm. you know, um, at least when you're in our industry, right? It's 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 a real bonding. I've made this for you. And so that translates so well when you look at retail, especially behind the deli counter or the bakery counter. That's a real baker who baked that bread or that cookie or that dessert just for you. And so that opportunity for the customer, for the consumer to interact with that person, I made this for you. What a beautiful emotional bond. And, and everyone says, you know, you should get to know your butcher. You should get mm -hmm. to know your fish man. You should get to know your baker. And I think it makes that personal connection much less industrial, right? You still have to be right every day. You still have to do it properly every day. But that emotional reward of, hey, I had that fish you sold me yesterday. That swordfish was so good. Mm -hmm. Or that bread. And I made a BLT because it's tomato season. It, it's just a greater emotional connection and it, and it's so rewarding. And so I went from uh, being a salesperson to Subway to them asking me um, to help them with their, let's say post-production quality. And they wanted to make sure that the chicken in Connecticut tasted like the chicken in California yeah. and how do we do that? And so for them, I devised a process that really drew in the manufacturer to understand what Subway was going for, what those specifications were about and what the end result was. And so it was a learning process of what did we really want to get out of this and whether it's a sauce or the bread or the chicken, whatever it meant was meant to be, we got those industrial representatives to really personalize that product. And so once I left Subway, I took that system, that process of personalizing and really understanding what the end product needs to be and how we bring that to life for the manufacturer. And so that's become what me and my team do. We go through the product and we really understand what are those nuances that make that product what it is, what is the flavor, what is the texture, what is that consumer's journey from choosing it from the shelf or choosing it from the bakery or choosing it from the deli? What, what is that? What's that journey? 
until I get it home and I use it and I serve it to myself, my friends, my family. And what is that experience and what makes it special? We identify that in a real quantifiable way. What's the mm -hmm. texture? What should it be? How can we change it? Is there too much salt? Do we want to get um, artificial colors out of there? How do we replace them? And so when we do a product, an item replacement, then we talk about what, what it was, what it should be. And once we make a change, has that been, has that departure, has that mm -hmm. movement from the marker, I always like to call it, uh, been a good experience or not so good? And then how do we rephrase that? How do we change that to get either back to where we were or to make it better than what it was when we started? And so that's really the essence of what our business is. And we do that through sensory study. I've got a 12 of, train, mm -hmm. of 12 trained sensory specialists on my panel as well as some very particular ways to study the final product and really understand what it should be, what it needs to be, what are those attributes that we really need to focus on and how to help the manufacturer understand and really bring in their entire team from folks on the floor to their QA team, to their sales team, to really understand what's important about that final product and how what they do changes those outcomes. Seen Food Consultants is a really cool company. You've got a great team of experts. I was wondering if you could go well, maybe a little bit deeper about the services that you provide in helping um, snack and bakery and other food professionals get a handle on their recipes and their quality and all that good stuff. Sure, so a lot of times we work with white label or private label manufacturers mm -hmm. or retailers who have private label in their stores. And we were doing a project, a retailer um, couldn't quite figure out why their sales were dropping on one of their frozen items, um, a baked frozen good. And so what we did was we went out to the store, we purchased their item as well as numerous competitors of theirs, mm -hmm. both private label as well as branded. And we took them apart. We looked at all the ingredients that went into it um, as well as we baked the product ourselves because it was a frozen item for home baking. And what we discovered was that their product was not as good as their competitor. It really did not come out of the oven well at all. And what was the answer? The answer was that the preparation instructions were different and they were incorrect. And so we changed wow. those preparation instructions so they didn't have to change their formula. They didn't have to change anything. All we had to do was change the instructions on the box. Sales went up, problem solved. So sometimes it's that simple. And you wonder, didn't anybody make this at home to discover whether this was working right or not? Mm -hmm. Sometimes not. Sometimes you miss the simplest things. When we talk about the consumer journey, we also did a comparative study on um, something really basic in the in the snack items, which was ice cream cones. So we looked at the manufactured item, the branded item against all those private label items. And it was very clear that the branded item was the manufacturer for all the private labels. And we thought, what's the difference here? The interior packaging is the same. Everything looks the same. You know, what was the difference? Freshness. So the, pro the branded product, was less than 30 days old and every mm -hmm. other private label mm -hmm. had almost a year on it. Very different quality. Yeah. And so the heads up for the folks who were using that branded item as their private label, change your specs for shelf life. And now you're, now you're equal with the branded item at a lower cost. So there's a lot of nuances that sometimes have nothing to do with formula, but have everything to do with product age, instructions, preparation instructions. And so maybe you don't need a formula change, but you may need somebody like me to help you find that, to really go oh. out to the stores, buy all the products and make them together and give you a photographic journey of what does this look like 
and how does it turn out in the home kitchen? Another good example would be that during the pandemic, what did everybody do? Bake bread at home. Mm -hmm. So yeast makes a difference. We did a yeast study and we're shocked to discover that a lot of those products, when you just simply proofed it, some proofed up here, some proof down here. So your end result is not gonna be the same. So some private label, white label items were getting their yeast from one manufacturer that had great results and some weren't. And so that yeast did not perform as well as some others. And so really understanding that performance and that development, you could still use the same yeast but maybe change your instructions so that you wanna let it proof twice as long so you get the lift that you're looking for. Another way I really like to help manufacturers, especially somebody working with a co-man, is to really enliven that specification. If you just say salt, that's not good enough. If you just say chocolate, not good enough. You wanna make sure where your chocolate comes from, What's the granulation of the salt? What is the age of the product on the inputs? Because especially when you talk about heat, you know, if you're gonna use a cayenne pepper or a smoked paprika, you wanna make sure it's six months or less on age before you put it into your product that you're then gonna give a year on. Don't forget uh -huh. there's a lot of products, especially seasoning that will age out because the air on there, you'll get air mm -hmm. and it'll oxidize and you'll lose heat. And the other thing is when you bake something or when you cook it, especially something with heat, you're gonna wanna add more product in there. You wanna, if you really want to carry that flavor or that, or that spice in there. So there's a lot of different nuanced ways that we can help suppliers understand how to change or enhance their ingredient declarations, not just the declarations, but what those inputs are into the specification. It's really um, ingredient management, specification management. That's cool. Um, that makes a difference, yeah. Uh, let, let's walk back a little bit. Um, say the owner of a bakery operation in like the South side of Chicago picks up the phone and says, Hey, Nancy, Joe, I need your help. My bread is good, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through like what the initial conversation might be, um, questions you might ask them and then what next steps might be after that initial talk. Sure. So, so over the phone, when they say good, I'm going to understand what good means. Mm -hmm and where they want to get to. So is it crust performance? Is it crumb performance? Do they want big holes in there? Maybe they have big holes and they don't want that. So you really need to understand how to define where you are today and where you want to go. Maybe mm -hmm. it's too crusty. I'm Italian. There is no such oh, thing as too crusty. I want to fight. Yeah, I want to fight with that bread. <laughs> But yeah. in the Midwest, that, that may not be what you want. You may want something soft. You may want something that's pillowy. That's, you know, a, a romance of, of a feather light. So, so understanding where they want to go is really important. And then the next step is to say, have you experienced a change while using the same ingredients? And if the answer is yes, then you go right back to when was the last time you had your equipment calibrated? So some real basic, basic questions. Now, do you want to add something? Do you want to add inclusions? Do you want to add chocolate? Do you want to add a flavor? Are you using the same basic dough? So has something changed with the dough? Has something changed in the water? Has something changed in your yeast? Have you recently changed suppliers? So just the tiniest subtle changes can really make a big impact on the end result. Do you have a new employee? It could just be that simple. So we really need to understand what kind of changes are happening. Then I would ask, let's take a look at a sample of where you are today. And have you seen a sample of where you want to go in the supermarket at a retailer, something else? Where do we want to go from here? And so having a goal, having a marker, having something to aim for is much easier than I just want to make it better. So sometimes under, 
really getting an understanding of where you are and where the person wants to go is the most important. And just dialogue might get you there without actually saying, have you changed the salt? Have you changed the sugar? Have you changed the flour? It could be as simple as I've been buying flour from the same guy for years and all of a sudden something's different. Their protein value could have changed. They could have been buying it from someone else. They could have changed mills. There's a million different things with flour that can, even if you haven't changed something, something with your manufacturer could have Mm -hmm. changed. And so maybe it's as simple as you need a protein enhancer. You need to add an enzyme. So there's, there's a million different buttons you can push, but pushing them all at once is a bad idea. So really with baked goods, you want to take it step by step, step by step, step by step. Change one thing, go back, change the next thing. Go back, change the third thing. Mm-hmm. Don't change flour, protein, you know, um, yeast. Don't change everything at once. Change one thing at a time and start with calibration. Did something with the oven change? Mm-hmm. Start by calibrating your oven, then do it again. And so you you really have to take a very measured approach so that you can make sure that everything you do is repeatable. Otherwise, you don't know what change you made to get to your end result. That's really cool. Well, um, sometimes it's frustrating, though, because it takes a little patience. You want to change everything at once and flick a switch and get there. And that's not how you get there with baked goods. Baked goods is a science. It's not that creative, let me add a little more salt and, 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 you know, microgreens. And I changed the look of my, of my entree. It's, it's, it's much more science-based. It is. And that approach sounds like the right way to go. And um, you've got really deep expertise in the food industry. And you're, I'm grateful that you're bringing that expertise to our upcoming online event. Um, September 28th, you're going to be talking about clean label bread insights. I was wondering if you can give us a sneak peek. Little taste. Sure. So I think a lot of people are getting wrapped up in gluten-free. And I'm afraid of that because I don't think the consumer's passion is all about gluten-free mm-hmm. as much as this, the old Atkins adage of if I'm gluten-free, I'm carb-free as opposed to reduce carb. And I think that you can get a lot more bread satisfaction out of a carb reduction. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with some really interesting flours now. And so instead of going zero gluten, put put some flour in there because you're going to need it to get where you want to go. But then try and swap out some other interesting flours and I really like chickpea flour because you're adding protein. You can add some really valuable fiber with some other mixtures. So I would encourage bakers who are trying to reduce, try and reduce carbs as opposed to go straight gluten-free because you're not reinventing the wheel. You're just tweaking it a little bit. And I think you can get a lot of different places. And I, I'm also excited to talk about size and shape because there is some new information about how many single households there are Mm -hmm. or households with just two people in it like my house and I don't want to buy a whole loaf of bread but I want to have a beautiful bread experience and I think Wegmans is a great example of how to sell somebody like me fresh bread because you can buy a half a loaf And now I wind up going to Wegmans and buying four instead of one half loaf (laughs) Um, because you can't help it. You can't help it. And so beautiful bread presentation is not just an abundance of one or two things, but a lot of selection. Because if I have multiple breads to choose from, I'm going to choose multiples. And so that's what we want to do. So how do we take one basic formula and make multiples. And so that's going to be part of the conversation. I'm really excited to have you at this online event. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is um, because you've, you know, probably raised people's interest. I'm going to put a link 
underneath this video. So if you're interested in um, taking part and sitting in, asking Nancy Joe a couple of questions, uh, feel free to register for the event. It's a free online lunch and learn. So it's a half hour of your time. Pack a lot of information in that. So very much worth your time. Um, but until then, Nancy Joe, I'm going to let you go because I'm sure you've got a busy day ahead of you. But and listen, if anybody has questions or issues or problems that they want to ask me about, I welcome them to hit my website, which is seatonfoods.com. And you can shoot me an email from there. I will put it on the, the, sc the screen right after our smiling faces go away. So, um, well, Nancy Joe, thanks a ton for your time. Thanks for telling us all about your company. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. And thanks for listening, everybody. Until next time.